A 46-year-old female patient presents with this swelling around tooth number 23 and 24. Tooth number 24 is extremely loose. She saw another dentist the previous day who said, you've got to extract this tooth. She said, I'm not ready to extract that tooth. Uh, and she said, I'm not going to get a dental implant either because I have a cousin, a friend, whatever it is, who had problems with dental implants. She's here for another opinion. What do you do? That's what we'll discuss today on practical treatment planning. The patient arrived with her husband. She drove over 50 miles to come to see us, which is nice. I'm a periodontist, and this is periodontal disease. By the way, she was told by the other dentist that she would have to see a periodontist, but that he could start her. That is an error. It's an error to say that. When you have somebody with severe periodontitis, you don't co-treatment plan. You don't begin the treatment. You do refer the patient to a periodontist if you can't handle it yourself. We're going to go over some hints today on how you could handle this case yourself. She can only close down on this one tooth, on tooth number 24. What do you do? Let's take a look at the periapical radiographs. So first, let's take a look at tooth number 24, and you notice how little bone support there is for tooth number 24. So you've got two things going on. Tooth 24 is the only one that's hitting, and the patient has lost bone almost down to the apex, and the gingival tissue is swollen. Let's review the other radiographs, and I apologize for some of the overlaps. The patient is highly anxious, and understand we do the best we could, uh, but we'll have the CT scan to show you in just a minute. And let's just progress all the way through and see what the bone loss is like. You'll notice the distal aspect of tooth number uh, four, a great deal of bone loss there. There are some teeth, though, that have no bone loss at all, right? Okay. And we take a look at this. We go uh, around this. We'll show the pocket depths uh, in a moment. But you'll get an appreciation for the distribution of bone loss that's present. As we get back into the number 14 area, 15 area, there is obviously more bone loss in those areas. We get down to the lower severe bone loss on tooth number 19, but tooth number 20 isn't doing bad. There's an angular defect between number 20 and, and number 19, but primarily it's tooth number 19 that's lost the bone support, and that's the way periodontal disease works. It works on a tooth-by-tooth -tooth basis. I know we think it's a widespread disease, and in this case, um, it is. But it, as a widespread disease, it's still a tooth-by-tooth -tooth disease. And you'll find that the radiograph sometimes can be deceptive. The patient will look like she's missing, teeth, missing bone between the roots, but it's one root that's actually lost a lot of bone support. The other root has them, but because the bone is so sparse and there's not much density to it because of the lucency in, in the area of the defect, it looks like both teeth have lost bone when, in fact, that hasn't, hasn't occurred. Let's continue, and we go down the arch, and there's tooth number 24 again. And you can see there's bone loss on tooth number 23 and number 25, but not nearly as severe on tooth number 24. We continue down the arch, and you'll see bone loss in the posterior uh, quadrants. Now, interestingly, she has swollen gingival tissue as well. Let's look at the bite wings first, and you'll notice that there is a defect in the distal aspect of tooth number four. I was not able to uh, determine caries in that area, but we'll be exploring that as we go through treatment. There's nothing that we're going to treat from a caries perspective. Now, she is in acute distress, and we've got to get the periodontal distress gone before we start thinking about restorative dentistry, even before we start thinking about what teeth we can save and what teeth we can't. More on that, because we're going to decide to save every tooth. Yeah, I know. We're going to decide to save every tooth. It's a patient management decision. It's also a practical decision here. You'll see more as we proceed with the treatment plan. If you like what we're doing on practical treatment planning, please like, subscribe, and share this video with your dental colleagues. This will improve our YouTube prominence. The periodontal probing chart shows you the depth of defects. Now understand when I'm probing, I'm going to be very careful in probing. I don't want to take a person who's anxious and give her distress through a periodontal probing examination that's going to go too deep. I want to represent the pockets, but I'm not going to go as deep as I might. Some of these pockets that are nine may actually be 11. I want to get a feeling of two things. Number one, what's the pocket depth as well as I can without putting the patient in distress. And the second thing I want to do is feel the root surfaces. I want to see how smooth or how rough the root surfaces are. I want to get an idea as to what the calculus factor is as I'm doing that probing examination. As you go around the arch, you'll see how severe these pockets are. 
nine millimeters on the distal aspect of tooth number four, nine millimeters on the distal aspect of tooth number 13. Notice 23 and 24, I chose not to probe at all. Why? Because I didn't want to hurt the patient. Tooth number 24 had a class three mobility. Tooth number 25 has a class two mobility. I can gain nothing out of probing these teeth now. I'm curious, of course, but this is a patient management problem. She wants to be in our office. She wants to get good treatment done. She wants to be sedated. She's already told me that. And um, she's already told me that she doesn't want an implant. So look at all of the barriers we have to overcome. And these are barriers that you can overcome as well. Reviewing the CT scan, we're going to go across the arch. And I want you to look at how much bone there is. Not how much bone that's been lost. How much bone there is. And you'll get an idea on the right side of the screen. The right side of the tooth is the buckle. The left side is the lingual. You're getting three representations of each tooth. And notice the tooth that's in contact right here with very, very little bone support at the apex. Isn't that something? Very little bone support. I didn't say no bone support. Very little bone support. There's still apical bone, isn't there? And remember, she's banging on this tooth. It's the only tooth that she touches. As we go across, you'll see there's more bone support on the surrounding teeth. And so we go through this and we look at the good news, not the bad news. The good news, what can we do to help this patient? What are we able to accomplish? Now you take a look at tooth number 15, you'll see how much bone loss there is there. But tooth number 14, there's no bone loss at all or very little. So we're looking here for opportunities. And that's how we talk with the patient in terms of opportunities. What's the first thing you do for the patient at the time of the examination? You take her out of distress. How are you gonna take her out of distress? Well, she won't let us extract tooth number 24, and I've gotta tell you, I don't wanna extract tooth number 24. I don't wanna leave her with a hole in her mouth. The tooth is infected and she's banging on the tooth. That is secondary trauma from occlusion. What's the first thing we'll do? That's right, we relieve the trauma from occlusion. So I take a diamond burr and I just cut down the incisal ledge until she's no longer biting on that tooth. I then ask her to bite down. Can you make that touch? She said no. I said, are you able to close fully? She says yes. She's out of distress. The dentist the previous day had prescribed clindamycin for her. Why clindamycin? Because she said she has horrible yeast infections when she takes amoxicillin. Amoxicillin is the drug of choice she was given clindamycin. Clindamycin doesn't work very well. Uh, most periodontists don't prescribe clindamycin. I would recommend that you take clindamycin out of your regimen. It's not necessary. Uh, the secondary drug, if she can't take amoxicillin, is actually cephalexin. Now, I know that you hear there's a cross-reactivity between cephalexin and amoxicillin. I think that's old news. We're looking now at the incidence of penicillin allergy and there are recent reports that are saying 1%. In other words, a lot of reports of childhood allergy to penicillin may not be true. And in terms of the cross-reactivity between cephalexin and amoxicillin, if it does exist, it only exists in the anaphylaxis cases. If the patient says that she has an allergy to penicillin, the next question you ask then is, what was the allergy, what happened? And sometimes the patient will say, well, it was when I was a kid, and I don't know. Uh, another thing that we'll see more often than not is I had an itching reaction, and that's most of the allergies to amoxicillin, urticaria, some kind of rash or some kind of itching. But if there's itching, that is not an indication for not using a cephalosporin. The, if we believe the data on cephalosporin, which is being questioned right now, um, the only cross-reactivity we have with cephalosporin and amoxicillin or cephalosporin and, and penicillin is when there's an anaphylactic reaction. In a case like this, I'm going to take a shotgun approach. So on this day, I'm going to prescribe two medications. One will be the cephalexin, 500 milligrams, and I'll provide 28, and it'll be one four times a day. The other will be metronidazole, 500 milligrams, one twice a day, and let her take that for a week. Now, before she does that, I want to run an oral DNA test. So what I want is full diagnosis here. I want to find out what bacteria is growing there. 
So she spits into a cup and we send the saliva sample out to oral DNA laboratory. And within a week, we'll have an idea as to what bacteria is growing there. Why do I want to know that? I want to know that I prescribe the correct antibiotic or the correct combination of antibiotics. I've got to tell you the most of the time, a combination of amoxicillin, or in this case, a cephalosporin, and metronidazole is sufficient. Still, I want the diagnostic data. I want to know that I prescribe the correct thing. If I prescribe the right thing, then within 24 to 48 hours, the patient will feel significant relief. So I saw her yesterday, I called her today, she has significant relief. After all, we took away the trauma from occlusion and we've got an antibiotic combination that's working. The next stage is to work with her and decide what she can do. She wants to be sedated, we do sedation in her office and we do IV sedation in her office, so we're gonna do that. We're gonna separate this out into a two hour visit and a three hour visit. What's gonna be accomplished at the two hour visit and the three hour visit? Well, primarily it's going to be root planing, but root planing by perioscopy. I use the endoscope and I've been using the endoscope or hygienists have been using the endoscope for almost 24 years. We've been using the endoscope very successfully. It's taken me out of the periodontal surgery business. It took me out of the laser business. In other words, if we're able to get access to the root surfaces and we're doing a good job in cleaning the root surfaces off, and we know that we can only go down four millimeters below the gum line by feel, but by inspection, in my opinion, and in our experience, we're able to inspect the root and do a much better job in cleaning the root surface off, we can get resolution of this case without ever going to a laser and without ever going to periodontal surgery. What else will be accomplished at those two visits? Well, besides instrument, instrumenting the root, I want to give, give tooth number 24 a chance. I tell her it's not going to have a big chance. I don't think it has a big chance, do you? But why take the tooth out? We've already relieved the occlusal stresses. We're relieving the infection with the antibiotic and with the perioscopy treatment, with the root debridement. Why not splint it in place and see what happens? What do we have to lose except the cost of a splint? And so we'll use a composite splint that will go from 23 to 25 that will splint number 24 in place. We will probably put that splint on the facial and the lingual in order to be able to give as much rigidity as possible. We'll warn the patient not to chew in that area, that we need to give it every opportunity to heal without stress and then we observe the results. So after the treatment, we'll wait six weeks and we'll do a periodontal probing examination again, see where we are. We'll leave everything in place. We'll see her again in three months and then in six months and we'll take a new set of radiographs and we'll see how she's doing. My expectations are that most of these areas will heal. Will they heal enough that we can keep all of the teeth? I don't know. But what I want to do is give this patient every opportunity for full healing, giving her full understanding that I'm not sure and we're going to do the best we can and give her a chance. And at six months, we'll have a much better idea as to where we are. But because there's a lot of bone support here, I can give her a lot of assurance that she's going to be able to keep most of her teeth. And hopefully, and I've seen it happen, all of her teeth. Maybe 24 is gonna be lost five or 10 years from now. Maybe that becomes a continual source of a problem and she's finally convinced that she needs to take it out. It doesn't all have to be done right now. We're minimizing trauma, we're giving her a positive experience, and we're giving the patient every opportunity for healing. If you want to see more on what we do with some of our occlusal trauma cases, take a look at this video.